It actually is running right off the laptop here. Okay. That's not doing it. Yeah, I don't think that's connected. Yeah, it's not doing it though. That maybe. Yeah, let's go to where is it? It's right there. No. Okay. It's interesting because what it's showing up there is on this other screen. Okay, excellent. It's all right. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Jerry Hamby, and I'm a lead volunteer at Exploration Green Conservancy. I'm also a member of the Gulf Coast Chapter of Texas Master Naturalists. And I want to talk to you about a project in Clear Lake that I've been working on for about four years. Um, Hard to believe this is in the middle of Houston, but that is a habitat island out in the middle of a lake that was developed over the last few years. Exploration Green uh, is, has a master plan that's going to be played out over five years. And the first phase of this was actually a test pond. I have a brief history of how the park uh, developed. First of all, it was on the side of the Old Clear Lake City Golf Course, which opened in 1963 and was in existence for about 50 years, or 40 years. The property was eventually going to be subdivided for uh, residential and retail development, community uh, activists, members of um, various entities got involved and wanted to save this uh, project. In 2011, the Clear Lake City Water Authority purchased approximately 200 acres, and their idea was to develop a multipurpose park. Uh, one thing that just happened as a matter of chance is after Hurricane Ike, my wife and I spent a lot of time riding our bikes through this now abandoned golf course. And so I took photographs of every remnant that was there. And so I got these T markers, which disappeared very, very quickly. This gives you a sense of what the park looks like even now in undeveloped sections. There was a conservancy established in 2013. And again, the, the intent was to try to create a multi-purpose site. The most important development actually occurred a year later in 2014 when a conservation easement was signed with Galveston Bay Foundation. And what that did is essentially lock in the protection of this land so that even if it changed hands, if the Water Authority decided to sell it, the land was protected and obligated to follow the master plan. True development of the park could not be realized until the Texas uh, Commission on Environmental Quality finally gave approval to put reuse water in. Channels had to be dug. Those channels will eventually be connected. They all go out into Horsepin Bayou, and when the water levels get low, we need to add water. We also use reuse water to irrigate, so it was crucial to get that. It held us up probably about two years, but once we started, this is what a lot of the people in the neighborhoods were dreading, this ugly trench. This is October 2015. And the way the first phase was developed, it was in three separate parts. And so they wanted to do a test pond. And so you're seeing actual contours of what that first test pond is. You'll see markers in some of the photos that'll look familiar. There's a little white rectangular shape in the upper right-hand corner. That's the USGS uh, uh, well. And it's used to measure subsidence. So I'm gonna jump ahead the following May. And so this is the end of phase 1A. And what happened at that time is we were allowed to go in and plant wetland plants. And I'm looking at this from the outflow. And so this pond feeds out into a channel that goes into Horsepin Bayou. And you can see that water level rise uh, goes up and down depending on the rainfall. So this is our very first wetland event in May 2016. And to me, the most startling development is between this picture and exactly two years later. And that's what it looked like when I was there and uh, taking this photograph in May from that same vantage point. And what you can see is a lot of wetland um, moving in 
spreading, diversifying, bringing in uh, a large number of volunteer plants as well. So how did this happen? Uh, hundreds of volunteers have taken part in this, and over the course of those two years, um, 16,000 native wetland plants have been installed. And that took place over 14 planting events. And what you're looking at here is uh, one of the two shelves over what is uh, section 1C. And so that shelf goes out, it goes out, and right past the point where you see the last volunteers, it suddenly drops about eight feet. And this is Mary Carol Edwards, and she actually tested that once when she went right <laughs> off that edge. Uh, she was putting out stakes to see how far, and it, it'll just catch you by surprise. Mary Carol has overseen all facets of the wetland work. She has an on-site nursery. Uh, if anybody's looking for volunteer work, uh, Thursday mornings, most Thursday mornings, Mary Carol is out there um, propagating. Sometimes they go to the phase one site and uh, deal with invasives. Sometimes they go off site and bring in uh, propagated plants, even plants that come from here. My responsibility has been regarding the tree nursery and planting of trees. So over a three year period, we have planted uh, approximately 800 trees. The master plan calls for 1,000 trees per phase. We still have room to, to put in probably 150 or so more trees once we're given the clearance from the water authority to be able to go into those sites. Uh, we've had 13 events. Most of our planting is done in the spring. I'll talk about a little exception to that in a few minutes. And this is just kind of a typical event we did this spring. I'd point out the woman on the right is Anna Dykeman uh, with Galveston Bay Foundation. She is the land steward coordinator. She is the one who makes sure that we are meeting the terms of the master plan. And whenever we um, finish planting events, we forward to her information about what we've planted to get the approval. We get the approval in advance, but get the approval that we're still on track. Barry Ward is holding the shovel. I'll tell you more about Barry in a minute. Uh, our most ambitious planting project occurred last November in there, that Habitat Island I was talking about. Uh, we planted 175 trees, and all of those trees were taken over just as you see here, two at a time on a single boat. Um, it was just an amazing thing to watch. We, we grew the trees on site in the nursery. We brought them over to the site during the week leading up to this, and then we just ferried them across two at a time. Those trees, when we got them, those were probably some of the largest ones. Uh, we got those in January 2014, and they were probably initially in 15-gallon pots, so about that tall. The thing is, because there were challenges to the project, we kept having to up pot, up pot, and eventually our largest ones were in 45-gallon pots. Uh, we still have or will have about 70 trees in pots of that size. Were they planted by hand? They were planted by hand. Now, the digging, I'll tell you more about in a minute. That's a little trickier prospect. So this gives you a view of the island pre-planting. This is the staging. And, and the idea was we had a group of volunteers who went in, as I said, over the course of a week. And they staged all this. They got everything ready. We had color-coded certain trees to be down by the water, uh, bald cypresses, for instance. And we move our way up until we get to the top. We have understory. Um, we have uh, canopy. And so everything was color coordinated. Every tree planted exactly where it was supposed to be. So the day of the actual planting, we had 109 volunteers, and it took them only four hours to put those trees in the ground. Now the digging. Uh, when we're lucky, we get an auger like this. That's Barry again. Uh, it looks like he's attacking the, the bit. He's actually cleaning the mud off of it. This is very heavy, dense clay soil that's been compacted by tractors going over it, taking dirt out of the site. This was pre Harvey. He dug 100 holes for us, or 70 some holes for us. Harvey filled the holes. <laughs> Island totally reshaped, resculpted, went back. We did manage to get about 100 holes pre dug. The remaining ones had to be hand dug. This is a group of some of the core volunteers. Um, this is really what makes this project work is there is a group of about 12 to 15 people who are just absolutely phenomenal. They, they are team leaders when we do the planting. So that when we have, say, 100 people show up to help plant, have a group of, say, 8 to 10 team leaders who will take 4 to 6 people, go out, and guide them through the whole process of an individual tree. And, and it allows us to kind of get this um, effect of building instead of a bunch of people waiting around for something to do. A group of people shows up, 
we send them out to plant. We actually modeled this in great part on uh, what I observed with John Egan and his work here at Sheldon Lake. The plant lawn moves so smoothly, we thought we've got to find a, a way of doing that ourselves. This is a picture from the tree nursery a couple of years ago. A lot of what we do is maintenance of those trees. In fact, as I speak, there are volunteers out there today up potting trees. Um, this is us at our capacity. At one point, we had about 1,000 trees in the nursery. We're now down to 250. We're going to replenish them this fall. Here's another shot of the uh, Habitat Island. Um, maintenance has become our largest concern. With all those trees on the ground, we have to go in and prune them, bring, uh, take the undergrowth out from them. The trees occasionally have to be restaked, tied, in their irrigation systems. There are nine irrigation systems in phase one alone. Uh, all of them have their own little quirky elements. The hardest one for us to manage, of course, is on that island because we have to go to the island to actually check the lines. We go out there about once every four to six weeks. Another thing we do, of course, is remove dead trees. Here's Brian, my good friend Brian Schrock, pulling out a dead tree. Um, we've lost only about 5% of the trees we planted, which is a pretty good record. Uh, most of those trees, they're difficult trees to establish, like uh, eastern redbuds, crab apples. Some of them, we didn't get the water irrigation system in in time to get that regular watering. And so we've been methodically replacing trees as we go along. It is amazing just the variety of work we do here, partly because we have a lot of wetland work as well. Uh, this is an event that took place a week after we planted trees on the island. So this is a, a wetland event where the volunteers actually placed plants using dibbles in the water around the island. And then, of course, there was Tropical Storm Harvey. Um, these two photographs were taken 10 days apart. The picture I showed you earlier of Barry going after that auger, that was this very day, that first one I was there just shortly after sunrise. And so that little part of the middle is the beginning of the island. The island had not yet been completely made. The final land bridge had not been taken out. The bottom picture was actually taken four days after the peak of Harvey. Uh, I was more concerned with potential flooding in my house than going out to this park to see what had happened. So I didn't get pictures of it, but the water was actually three to four feet higher than what you see here. The amazing thing about Harvey is the extent to which the detention system did exactly what it was supposed to do. The pond was only 80% excavated at the time, but estimates are it held up to 100 million gallons of water. Saved potentially 200 homes right on the periphery of that park that did not flood, that have flooded in the past. And it's in part because this release goes over a period of days, weeks, instead of sending all that water out at once. The phase one completion was this spring when um, a concrete trail a mile long was completed around the park, around the lake. And that has made a huge difference in terms of reception in the community, in terms of use of the park. The night I took this shot in April, this was like a Tuesday or Wednesday night, I counted 78 people out there. And uh, I've heard reports from others who've counted more than 100 people on a, a typical evening in the summer. So the park is definitely getting a lot of use. Most importantly, and this is one of the key reasons we built this park, it's brought back a lot of uh, wildlife, birds particularly. I talked to volunteers with Audubon in February, and they counted between 25 and 30 species on the phase, that many of which they had not seen there before. And so it's been incredible just to see the return of those birds. Uh, the whistling ducks, I count easily as many as three dozen almost any time I'm out there. And the other part of this, uh, there's been a lot of very positive publicity. Unfortunate that we had Harvey, but what that has meant is now this has become a model. And a lot of people who were resistant to this project now see it as a way of salvation for urban flooding. The articles that I just sampled here cover a range. Some of them are local, like the Houston Chronicle piece you see up in the top, business-related uh, publications, um, wetland-related publicity. Uh, and even the Washington Post did a story on this uh, earlier this spring, USA Today. So word is getting out. Um, I think there's going to be um, focused attention on how other places can do this. So let me give you a quick view of, of what's coming next. Um, phase two has already begun, 
and it will be completed within a year. Phase three and four will be uh, started a, a year from now. Phase five, a year from then. So 2020, 2021, all five phases should be developed. And that is it. Almost 200 acres. Called exploration, green. exploration Green. 